This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Susan Love has uh, spent her life being a pioneer in more ways than I have time to mention. She has a brilliant gift for voicing women's concerns and needs to the medical and scientific community and for explaining complicated science and medicine to real life women. I'm honored to call her a friend and a role model. Uh, colleagues, I present to you the amazing Dr. Love to present the amazing breast. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really great to be here, and it was great to hear all of these presentations. And how, am I, how do I change my slides? Oh, she's got it. Ah. <laughs> I just sort of do it with my power, magic powers, right? OK. Um, and what I wanted to talk about is not is the amazing human breast. Because you notice we've talked a lot about rats, but we haven't really talked very much about people. And its people are the ones, women particularly, but some men who get breast cancer. How can we end it? Well, we've heard a lot about thinking about how to prevent it. But in order to prevent it, we have to understand women's breasts. Um, rats are just not enough. The human breast is really a unique organ. It's the only organ we're not born with. We're born with stem cells behind our nipple, and that's it. And until puberty, and then all of a sudden, the hormones come and whoosh. I always think it's like those sponge animals that you put in water and they turn into a, you know. <laughs> that's sort of what happens. And you've got these breasts. And then every month, they're at the ready. You might get pregnant. Is this the month I'm going to get pregnant? Is this the month I'm going to have to make milk? No, OK, forget it. Oh, is this the month? And then finally, you do get pregnant. And then they turn into a milk factory, where they turn blood into milk which is pretty magical when you think about it. And it's not just, the milk is not only, it changes it according to the age of the baby. So what you give a, what the milk that you make for a newborn is different than the milk you make for a six month old. Um, and so that's pretty magical. And then at the end of that, massive cleanup, involution, and then you make new ducks for the next kid. Are they in the same pattern as the old ducks? Is there like a tract that it fills in? Or are there extra stem cells behind the nipple and you start with a whole new crop? We actually have no idea because we don't look at it. And yet it's the mo and then you have menopause where they go into retirement. Um, now, <laughs> they're the most common site of cancer in women, and maybe it's because we have all these changes. But most of the research is on animals. And most animals, rodents and animals, have one duct per teat. They don't have, we have probably six to nine, as I'll show you. Um, the breasts only develop for lactation, and then they go back down again. Um, and they don't naturally get breast cancer, except for domesticated dogs and macaque monkeys. Um, and even the stated site of the initiation of breast cancer, the duct ductal lobular junction, was based on a study in rats in 1975. So it may or may not be true in people. Um, why do we, what, why should we study people? Well, I think we need to understand the anatomy of the breast in people um, because it slowly progresses in the duct or the lobule until it becomes invasive. And we think that it takes, you know, eight to 10 years. Um, uh, there, are, there probably are early changes that precede cancer. And the unit of study really, I think, needs to be the duct, not the breast, because the cancer comes in the duct or the lobule, which is one unit. Um, we still don't know the anatomy of the ductal systems. And this is a picture that's often shown by Ashley Cooper in 1839. But if you look, uh, I actually have his book, um, and it says, the ducts were artfully displayed. So this is not the anatomy. He just laid it out for this pit, laid them out for this picture. Um, uh, are the ducts, is the anatomy consistent? After breastfeeding, do you have the same anatomy? Or do you start all new with new ductal cells and you have a whole new anatomy? Are there bacteria and viruses in the duct? We don't know. 
And um, what's the unit of, should the unit of study be the breast or should it be the duct, the milk duct? Um, traditionally, we say there's 15 or 20 openings in the nipple and 15 and 20 ductal systems. I don't know where that came from. And we make these weird pictures where the breast looks like a pizza. Um, <laughs> Where, when it's not a pizza, um, and we make them all in a radial distribution. All the ducts are exactly the same size, and all these pictures are basically two-dimensional, which the breast is also not. Um, but the human breast is really three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. This is still an artist's uh, reconstruction of ducts in a lactating breast based on a handheld ultrasound study done in Australia. Um, but it's at least closer to what the breast really looks like with multiple ducts coming and then distributing out. Um, and those ducts are suspended in fat and fibrous tissue, which is again unique in rats and, and other animal models don't have um, stroma, uh, in fact, because they don't have breasts that are sticking out when they don't need them, only when they're breastfeeding. Uh, and so you've got the ducts suspended in all this fibrous tissue. That's the neighborhood. That's what's giving you your breast density. And we don't know what the imp um, implications of that really are. Um, it seems, and I've been studying this for most of my career, actually, that the ducts are really arranged in two concentric groups. There's a center group and an outer group. What we did is we um, looked at a lot of women. We did ductograms, and then we analyzed them. And we could see that there are two or three ducts openings right in the center that go straight back in the chest wall. And then there's a net outer circle that are draped around it. Um, and that was, that was basically, um, and so you can pretty much figure out which duct is which. And these are, this is a study of how many duct openings there were. On the, or looking at all the studies of how many duct openings there were, we did one. Um, there are six to eight on the nipple surface. And everybody who looked at it from looking at the nipple surface, and this woman's nipple's been numbed up, by the way. Um, <laughs> Um, and, but if you cut the, the nipple off sub, on the subareolar level, there's 15 to 20. So a lot of times you'll see that there's 15 to 20. That means they're not, they're, they've already divided in two by the time they're looking at them. But in terms of opening in the nipple, six to eight. And then this is a transection um, below that. And you can easily, you can numb up the nipple. The nipple itself is pretty, um, is not very sensitive. It's the areola that has all the nerves in it and gives you the sexual stimulation in that. But the nipple is there to be chewed on by babies and lovers and whoever, and it really doesn't have that many nerves in it. So <laughs> you can actually put like a cc of, of uh, lidocaine just in the nipple, in the protuberant part, and you can do whatever, you can cannulate ducts They'll re they're relaxed. You can squirt things down the ducts. Um, I've done this to myself and many others um, and uh, uh, without any problem. Um, and so we have that false notion that it's really sensitive, but it's not. It's, it's the areola that's the sensitive part. This is from um, ductoscopy. And so you can cannulate the ducts through the nipple. You squirt some saline in to open up the duct, which is often collapsed if you're not breastfeeding. And then you can see how it, it, um, the, it bifurcates and trifurcates. Um, I love this picture because it sort of looks like it's outer space, but it's actually inner space um, because it's inside women's nipples. And we, we have a ductoscope. There is one that exists that's FDA approved. And we have scoped a lot of, that's how we got these pictures. But the problem with the ductoscope is you get lost because we don't have a map. So you need a Google map or Waze for the ducks <laughs> because you go in and then you turn right and then you turn and then you don't know where the hell you are. You know, you turn left and now you have no idea where you are. So that was the, the major problem with ductoscopy. Um, right now, you can explore the human breast with ductoscopy. You can explore it with nipple aspirate fluid, which is just sucking a few drops out. Um, that's what the diagram is. You can also do galactography, which is squirting contrast material down a duct and then doing a mammogram. You can do ductoscopy, as we said, and you can do speed of sound ultrasound, which is my hot new toy that I'm going to show you in a minute. 
Um, and the current um, research that we're doing at the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation um, on the ducts are looking at the microbiome of the breast and also exploring um, prevention. So um, we know that each duct is different. Um, the question um, really is, uh, was, uh, uh, is it different for everything or just some things? So we did one study that correlated the anatomy and the physiology um, of the fluid. We looked at estrogen, progesterone, protein in three ducts in initially and then six months later. And we showed there was no correlation between ducts, between breasts, or over time. So it's an, active, it's an active organ that's always doing stuff. And you can see in that nipple, um, I don't know if I have a pointer. Do I have a pointer? Oh, yeah, I do. There, well, you can see the different colors of the fluid on that nipple. I may have a, but it's not going to. Huh? I won't project. Sorry. Oh, wait. Well, so you see different colors. You see, you can have green, you can have clear, you can have milk, uh, white, and that sort of gives you, reflects the idea that each duct is different. We also looked at inflammatory cytokines in different ducts, um, and we showed no correlation. So really, the unit of study should not be the breast, it should be the duct. And that's what gets cancer, one duct, not a whole breast. Um, in mapping the ducts, um, and trying to figure out what the anatomy of the ducts are, um, it, it's been tricky, and we've tried a lot of different ways with contrast material um, and a lot of things. But I thought maybe if we studied lactating women, they would already have contrast because they'd have milk in their ducts. And so then we'd be able to easily map them. So we took seven lactating women, and we had them bring their babies, and we told them to come full, and then they'd feed their babies. So we did them full and empty. Uh, and we did 3D ultrasound. Um, and we use the uh, GE 3D ultrasound machine where you sort of squish the person and then the, the transducer goes over them. And what we found, we weren't able to do a map because when you squished it, all the milk got sort of squished and it became sort of blobby. But what we did find, though, was that not all the ducks were making milk. That you start out, and this really surprised the hell out of me, you start out in the lower outer quadrant and then you recruit more ducks as you need them. So I was always taught that, they, that it was supply and demand, that all the ducks were making milk, and then if you had twins or whatever, you made more milk. But no, you start here, and then you recruit more ducks. And the last duck to get recruited is the upper outer. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we always, we know the upper outer is the one that gets more breast cancer. So I can make up a story, I'm making this up, but maybe if you don't use the duct, it doesn't involute, you know, and it doesn't, and you don't grow out a new one. So maybe if you haven't breastfed long enough, you haven't used the upper outer, and that's why that has more breast cancers. That's just a hypothesis. I haven't proven that, but it could well be. Could well be. So anyway, but that wasn't going to give me my map. So then I went up and I tried um, up here in Novato at QT ultrasound. And they have a kind of ultrasound where you lay, they really push the fact that it's sort of, you lay on, a, on your stomach, your breast is hanging down into warm water. And <laughs> however, it's speed of sound. So you're in a cylinder of water. The ultrasound wave is, is, goes across and they measure it on the other side. So, and then whatever is in the way will reduce the speed of the sound going across, right? And we did it in lactating women, again, thinking that that would work. But unfortunately, it didn't work because they just had blobs of milk behind their nipple um, when they laid on their stomach like that. So we decided, so then I, that was two years ago. And then about three or four, uh, about a month ago, I suddenly got this in my office. They kept working on it, and this is the first 3D printed image of human breast ducts. Um, and I think, I don't know if, if it, it can turn around. No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Well, um, but ducks? so these are ducks. Those are ducks. Here, go back here. Now, the the upper outer is this part here, where you'd think it would be. Probably, uh, oh, here we go, a blood vessel.
Sorry, the straight one is probably a blood vessel. And then you can see there's an outer group and an inner group, which is sort of like the diagram that we made from looking at all those women. See, there's some that come straight up through the middle, and then there's these that are, that are around. You also notice no quadrants. <laughs> you know, I, it, we never said it was in quadrants. I think this really straight thing here is a blood vessel. But, and they're pretty flat. This is a 64-year-old woman, no contrast material. Um, and postmenopausal. So I, I, you know, I only have, I'm going to show you one more, but I only have two. Um, my, my big hope, and um, they say, this is up here, they say that he, he says he has lots of images. And so what I really want to see is how consistent is that? In other words, um, not, uh, not only woman to woman, but within a woman. So if you breastfeed and then afterwards you have involution, you make new ducts, are they in the same pattern as the old ones or do you have extra stem cells behind your nipple and you start all over again? We don't know. I mean, maybe one of the reasons why people, nuns have the most breast cancer is because they didn't breastfeed and they never had involution and they just keep acquiring mutations. I mean, it's one, hi one hypothesis at any rate. So um, I want to see, is it consistent? I want to see if it's different, premenopausal, postmenopausal. Um, I want to see a lot, but we're getting there. We're starting. This is uh, cancer, and the red up in the corner, up in the left-hand corner, is the cancer. And I think this one will turn, too. Yeah. So you can see when it comes around. I have these on my desk now. I just love it. There it is. Now, see the nipples on the bottom. She's laying on her stomach. And there, the red with the blue, that. The blue is maybe, I'm not positive, it may be DCIS. Um, and I think, again, this straight thing is a blood vessel. Because it's, it's probably not differentiating between blood vessels and, and the ducts. But it does, it, it is pretty, isn't it? It's like coral. It's really great. So this is the beginning. Um, and uh, stay tuned, because I think we may finally um, be able to event, to come up with um, a map. And then you could go back to things like introductory therapy, because now you could have a Google map that you could tell you exactly where to go. You could cannulate the right duct. You could squirt it or you could wash it out, um, th things that we were never able to do. Um, so the conclusion is that the ducts are really where the action is. There are six to nine ductal systems that open on the nipple which is, appear to be independent, as well as some rudimentary ducts, whatever that means, um, that are short and don't go anywhere. So they may be ducts, or they may actually secrete something um, or be uh, sebaceous glands. Um, there's an, it's an uneven distribution. It's certainly not um, quadrants um, and, or look like a pizza. Um, and it's <laughs> central and peripheral, so an inner group and an outer group. Um, the breast is pretty amazing. It can make blood into milk and change the milk, um, and it's where breast cancer starts. The second major question that we need to look at is the microbiome of the breast. When they did the human microbiome project, they didn't do the breast. They just forgot. Oh I, I think it was men, but I, I, I don't want to blame. <laughs> I don't want to blame all the men in the room, but I do think it just didn't occur to them. <laughs> um, so babies and lovers suck on the nipple. You know there's bacteria and viruses in the breast. Um, and then there's another theory. I mean, the people who even write about it came up with this theory that they, the bacteria catch like an Uber from the gut and then travel to the breast. When there's really such a direct route, it's hard to believe. Um, and you can test the microbiome. You can look at nipple aspirate fluid, ductal lavage, breast tissue, paraffin blocks. There's lots of ways. Um, and this is what I said. This is a human microbiome project where they skipped the breast um, entirely. Uh, uh, we did a study another, uh, where we looked at nipple aspirate fluid in women who had breast cancer versus not and showed a completely different um, microbiome. Uh, in the women with breast cancer versus not. Um, so there may be something there. Now, the, the, there are a lot of studies since then. Uh, that was one of the early ones. But they are all, they're all conflating the duct and the stroma. So they're just taking out chunks of tissue. So I don't know what that 
means, and they're also not doing it anatomically. So I don't know whether maybe there's a bacteria that's protective or, or a virus, or maybe there's one that's, that causes you to get into trouble. But as long as you're going to just treat the tissue like one big glob, you're not going to be able to, um, to figure any of that out. So that's still something we're working on. So one of the my next studies that I want to do is really look at the ductal fluid, <coughs> take somebody maybe who's um, going to have bilateral mastectomies and spend a few extra minutes and do ductal fluid and stroma and then maybe the other breast and see whether the microbiome is the same in all the areas or not. Um, uh, hard to know. So stay tuned. The other, the other thing about the human breast that I think is critical, and it's been alluded to um, uh, throughout this today, is um, because the breast goes through all these changes and has all these different times, that when you're exposed to some of these carcinogens or, or environmental hazards, um, probably matters. Um, and some of the data, needless to say, the, the early data is all in rats and mice. You can see, you can see. Mice and birth, childhood and adolescence. The mats and mice and rats for childhood and adolescence. Thank you. Um, and then, um, and then more studies as you as you go on. But it really probably makes a huge difference. So you can't just look at exposures without looking at when the exposures are happening and how that relates to the um, biology and physiology of the human breast um, uh, in terms of getting cancer. So in order to figure out breast cancer and its treatment in women, we need to study women, not rats and mice. Um, 10 years ago, we started the Army of Women to encourage researchers to move beyond rats and mice. I said to my friends who are researchers, why aren't you doing this on women? And they said, we don't know how to find women. And I said, <laughs> I know. I say, well, I know where to find them. So, <laughs> so what the what the Army of Women is is it's an email list. It sounds really fancy, um, but it's actually an email list of women and men with and without a diagnosis of breast cancer, and that are willing to hear about studies needing participants. So it's we it's not a study. All you're doing is signing up to get these emails. And now we have an app, which you're going to see. And there's some postcards on the way out you can get. So you could get an Army of Women app on your phone and hear about the studies. And then researchers come to us who need people, and we vet the studies. And if they're worthy, we e-blast them out to everybody. We don't match. Because if you match, then you have to keep everything up to date. And it's much easier to just send it out. And then the nice thing about that is that if you fit the study, you can RSVP, but you can pass it along. And so you may not fit the study, but your sister in Chicago may be perfect. I mean, the example, we had one study for Vietnamese women, and there are not a lot of studies that are focused just on Vietnamese women and breast cancer. And we probably had about three in the whole army of women. But we had the right three, because we had that study full in a day. <laughs> so it's a really good way if you, you know, to move from rats and mice into people. And also, it's a good way to hear about all the research that's going on. Um, so anybody can sign up. And you're not going to give us any, we don't collect any information, because that changes. And then we'd have to keep it up to date. We just keep your email, and we just send it out to you and let you self-select. I want to change what I do. <laughs> I don't want to have to do that anymore. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, that's too changeable. So. Now, this is our new video that we made because it's our 10th anniversary. <laughs> so you can do it. You can do it right now on your cell phone. You can go to um, either go to the website or download the Army of Women app, and you'll just be able to see what's going on on your app, and you can RSVP or not RSVP. Because it's all well and good to study rats and mice, but they don't get breast cancer. And if we're really going to be the generation that ends breast cancer, we're going to have to do it by studying women and men. Thank you.